So welcome, Daniela. Viva l'acqua. <laughs> Let's try and get this right. To the Kiyon Yoga uh, offering. Um, welcome, Daniela. Daniela is a research associate at the University of SOAS in London. Hello, Adam. Nice Hi. to see you. <laughs> Nice to see you. We're just having this little chat, actually. I have to mention it because it's kind of quite funny. As you see, if you can be watching on our um, video, you can see I hit my head uh, yesterday, actually scrolling through, um, looking at Daliella on YouTube, on my phone, and I was walking and I hit my head on a bar or a, you know, something sticking out. So for this nice cut on my head, it's Daliella's fault because she was so <laughs> riveting on, on, uh, on YouTube. If you, if, you, if you want to look at more of her stuff on YouTube, she has loads of stuff where she's... Uh, is really a holding forth on, on the subject that we're going to talk to today, which is, I suppose, particularly um, the Hatha Yoga tradition, uh, which she's uh, recently completed a project with uh, Jason Birch and uh, Jim Mallinson and Mark Singleton, I believe, as well. So yes. I think the four of you um, at uh, SOAS, it was a Hatha Yoga project. I think it finished in 2020. It was a five-year project. Um, and I suppose my opening question is, um, this is uh, really cutting edge stuff that you did there. And why, why do you think more research hasn't been done on Hatha Yoga so far? I mean, we're really opening out into a, a, a new world of, of scholarly research on modern mm -hmm. yoga and modern Hatha Yoga. And this is really, you know, the, you know, Jim, we could say, is probably the first person or one of the first people to really start doing this stuff. So why is it only so recently, do you think, that we, we, you know, we're encountering, some, you know, these texts that are talking about yoga and this, this uh, you know, this scholarship. Yeah, probably because before the attention was more focused on the philosophical side of yoga, while Hatha Yoga text focuses more on the, let's say, practical and physical practices. And, uh, you know, perhaps scholars uh, thought um, that wasn't, um, not that, uh, I... I don't know how to say it because it's like, uh, you know, maybe it was a kind of secondary literature, not that interesting because this, yeah, to this, yeah. this, uh, these textual sources are not even that challenges, uh, challenging for scholars. No. Uh, mm. They are quite simple mm. and the contents can be repetitive. Uh, and so maybe if they were not even interested themselves, I mean, the scholars uh, in the practices, why to focus on them? And so what you see, the, the, the bigger changes. I think is the fact that uh, there are a lot of uh, scholars slash, slash practitioners that are, um, are, are addressing these uh, textual sources. Right. And so they mm -hmm. have a uh, different curiosity towards this kind of, uh, of texts. And, yeah, uh, and someone lens. had to mm -hmm. open the field. I mean, it's always like that. There, is, there must be a yeah. groundbreaking uh, yeah. research to open the field. And, and Jim was able to do both, like, you know, starting the philological side of it and at the same time opening the ethnographic side of it. I mean, of course, there, are, there have been also other scholars working with sadhus and so on, but focusing the attention on... Um, asana and hatha yoga and yoga i think he was one of the the first one yes yeah it just strikes me that the kind of comparing the text and the kind of critical perspective on the body of vedic literature or indian literature is a you know it's a it is a recent thing and it's a you know mm. it's just kind of bizarre that so much has suddenly you know starting to come out where you know 20 years ago i suppose before norman uh, soyman and, and elizabeth yeah. michaelis we had, you know, we, we really had so little there. Um, but I want to rewind slightly. And I mean, the obvious question to ask you at the start is where and how did, did you get into all this? Because your background wasn't really as a practitioner, as it, you know, yeah, I think no. with Jim. I mean, Jim was, I think Jim was kind of obsessed with Vajroli Mudra, you know, and, and, <laughs> the, and Jason was a practitioner. <laughs> Jason was a practitioner. Um, but, you, you know, you weren't, I mean, you do a bit of yoga, I think, but you weren't, you know, yeah, really, that wasn't really your, your approach, and, was it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah. no, yeah. I am more into, I was more into the uh, Sadhu Samaj and the Sadhu Society. And so, because mm. I did my PhD on the Ramanandi Sampradaya, and Jim is involved with this uh, mm. order, this religious order. So when he was planning the Hatha Yoga project, he needed uh, an ethnographer to do research with sadhus. And so he was looking around for someone who could do that. And uh, since I did my PhD among sadhus, and it was like 40 years of PhD and the field work, because I re I'm really much into field work, love spending time among sadhus. 
And so he asked me if I was interested in doing this uh, postdoc research. And I mean, you can imagine after a PhD, before finishing the PhD, I got this offer and I was like, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. quite easy, actually, because it was a very good opportunity for me to keep working among sadhus and um, also, you know, deepening this knowledge about yoga, because as you said, I mean, I was, I spent a lot of time in, in India. So I did uh, yoga. I studied yoga, Ayurveda and all the stuff in Rishikesh, in Banaras, but very superficially, let's say, you know. And so this was like, okay, let's put the two things together and let's see what comes out. Who, you mentioned, and there's many articles you've written on the, the, the Ramanandi Sampradaya. Sampradaya. Yeah. Um, as you can see, like even with my pronunciation, I don't know the first thing about them. I mean, could you explain like what attracts you to them and 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 for you know the general public, I suppose, uh, you know okay. who, who they are. Okay, I yeah. mean, I was attracted to the Ramanandi Sampradaya because of the importance of the Ram Bhakti in India, the devotion towards Ram in India, and I mean, this can be a bit. Um, political because at the for my MA I did a research um, a thesis on the Ram Jamabumi issues the destruction of the Ayodhya uh, the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya and so since this was a very important event in the history of uh, Indian politics and society I wanted to go to the root of that kind of movement so the the devotion towards Ram and so I thought like okay which kind of, what, what, what sampradaya is related to the Ram Bhakti, to the devotion towards Ram? And it's the Ramanandi Sampradaya, which is the, the largest the Vaishnava order in, North, uh, in Northern India. And it's very much differentiated because in this uh, religious devotional group, you can find the three different branches. And so one is the Rasik, that is very devotional. One is the Tapasik, that is more connected with the practice of Hatha Yoga and austerities. And then there is the Naga section, the, the warriors that you see in other Sampradayas as well. And so I wanted to study more about this order. And especially, uh, I have to be very sincere, I wanted to stay in Banaras because I wanted to right. stay more and learn more about this city. And in, the, uh, in Banaras, there is the, the Shri Mat, that is uh, one of the, nowadays, the main Mat, the main monastery of this Sampradaya, which created in the 20th century the title, the charge, the office of Jagat Guru Ramanandacharya. And so I, I try to recreate the history of this uh, religious position in Banaras. Okay. Then it's how I got involved with the sadhus and uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For people that don't know, what's a sampradaya? A sampradaya is a, I mean, sampradaya is a word that means tradition. And it's used today as a, a way to address a, a religious group, religious orders. And the, the, what is important is that it's related and it contains paramparas. And these two aspects, the idea of sampradaya, related to uh, teachings, uh, customs that are transmitted is very important and very, I would say, unique in India because you see these different sampradayas and inside each sampradaya you have a lot of paramparas, a lot of lineages. And all these lineages can be very different from each other because they follow the transmission from guru to disciple, which makes uh, like the lineage, the parampara. So you have different lineages that means you have different paramparas, which means that perhaps you will have slightly different teachings that depends on the guru, because we have to stress the importance of the guru in the Indian traditions. So a guru mm. can modify mm. the teaching mm. because it's really, mm. you know, how you get the, the teaching from your guru and then how you elaborate the teaching and perhaps your own experiences is going to modify what you mm -hmm. learned and the way you transmit it then creates something unique. So it's like you transmit a teaching, perhaps an old teaching, but always innovating it. And this is, I think, what makes unique the traditions in India. Always if, um, alive. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, if we hadn't mentioned already, Daniela has spent enormous amounts of time in, in we call it in the field um, with uh, with sadhus at various mellas at various festivals um, and spending six months, generally a year yeah. in India um, until recent times with COVID and all that stuff. Uh, yeah. um, <laughs> just just hang, you know, just with a very difficult task, let's say, or, you know, or very well, potentially uncomfortable, at least task of uh, of hanging out with these guys in, in um, you know, in uh, biz- kind of bizarre circumstances quite often i'm sure um and really i really just want, would love to have an hour of daniela telling stories about um you know <laughs> these experiences really it should be much more fun than trying to make this kind of intelligent philosophical kind of episode <laughs> but i mean i think we'll persevere anyway a little bit and then we'll try and get some a couple of uh, little anecdotes out of her in the end but i mean we see, we see the Buddha mentions that he did some kind of yoga before, you know, um, you know, um, he reaching his enlightenment, right? You know, he, the, the, uh, it's mentioned clearly that he was an ascetic and he also did, he also tried yoga. And so this dates yoga at least 2,500 years old, right? You know? uh, but yet the texts, um, you know, um, state, um, we, we're finding texts stating uh, and talking about yoga, that Hatha yoga from probably, when are we, like maybe... You're probably better on the date. 11th I mean, century. 12th or, may, or was yeah, it? 11th. 11th. Yeah. yeah, okay, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, 11th, 12th century. So uh, we're assuming, and when you're talking to the sadhus, that there's a tradition that's going way, way back before that, but it's simply oral. Is that correct? Yeah, it is correct. But then we have to stress, like, what do you mean for yoga and what do you mean for Hatha yoga? Mm. That's the main point. So what was doing the Buddha? Yeah. What do you mean for yoga? This is my question to you, Adam. What do you mean for yoga? Yeah. What do you mean when yeah. the Buddha was doing? Well, it because... was a kind of segue into one into your famous article, really, on, on let the sadhus talk, you know, and <laughs> and what is yeah, and what is yoga exactly? That was just priming you, really. <laughs> okay, that's good for you. Yeah, I mean, the fact yeah. is that if yeah. we understood yoga as a sadhus do that basically is meditation then of course we can say that uh, ascetics were doing meditation since long time but uh, we have to always uh, be clear that uh, you see the word the yoga appearing in the kata upanishad and not before yeah. no so it's it's always a, a bit of a mistake to attribute to previous timings practices or method because yoga is a method that were not clearly called like that but then the Buddha was doing also tapas, right? Tapasya. He was ma- basically doing austerities. And because of the austerities, he decided, okay, I will create my own middle path without, you know, extorting my body and uh, my mind in this kind of practices. So, uh, I mean, th- there is this connection. I, I can say that uh, this is something that I'm working on right now, the connection between Hatha Yoga and tapas. Because the two practices, the tapasya and hatha yoga, how it is understood by sadhus and as it is described in vernacular sources is very, is very much connected. Um, and so it's, uh, that, as you said, is strictly related to an oral transmission. So we, we don't have well, a lot of... When we talk about tapas, just, yeah, just yeah. to clarify, tapas, uh, will you define what tapas is? You're probably... I would Better say that tapas. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not a Sanskritist. Uh, uh, but tapas is a kind of inner uh, heat, inner spiritual heat that you produce by doing tapasya, austerities. It's like you know, for everything in this field, that yoga is the method that helps you to reach yoga, and tapas is the inner heat that you have to produce through tapas, through tapasya, austerities, to have more tapas. And the same is like for other practices, like, you know, if you do dhyana, you do dhyana to reach dhyana, different exercises to meditate, to reach eventually that kind of latest meditation. So tapas is, all, is like basically a penance, really, right? Would it, would, could we equate tapas to be like an old-fashioned penance like we know in the, you know, in the Catholic Church? You know, kind yes, of, definitely. Or kneeling down and, and, and kneeling your way to some pilgrimage site or whatever like that, yeah. right? Anything yeah, exactly. that kind of puts anything that makes you kind of uncomfortable, basically. Yeah, right? ex- I mean, in some some uh, scholars call it like sacred pain, like you know the way you sacred use the pain. pain right. Yeah, sacred pain. Mm-hmm. The way you mm-hmm. use like physical pain to overcome your body, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because sometimes through pain you can overcome the body and even like mental levels or reality. But we have to remember that, I mean, in the uh, South Asian context. Uh, Tapas can be associated to different practices, not only pain. I mean, of course, it is something that has to be done in a very stubborn way. 
But even meditation, you can do it in a very stubborn way. Like, you know, you mm-hmm. meditate 10 hours a day. This mm-hmm. is a form of tapasya because it's like you are mm-hmm. meditating 10 hours a day. So it's the way you do an action that transforms so it in a tap. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So everything yeah. can become a tapasya and can produce tapas eventually. If it's done with a kind of, I mean, as Jim, yeah. Ma- James Madison says, a kind of bloody mindedness, he uses the English expression, <laughs> which I love the term, and I think I've quoted it a number of times, a kind of bloody mindedness, which means, in, in, you know, if you're not a native English speaker, a kind of stubbornness, like Daniela says, you know, a kind of, you know, that kind yeah. of, uh, you know, it, blinkage, exactly. kind of, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and, and to, if it kills me, I'm going to do it, we, we exactly. say in English. And, right? and, Even, and this is know. also what sadhus think about Hatha Yoga, that is why the two has yeah. to be strictly related. I mean, there are some parts that are missing in these historical reconstructions. That is why scholars are like, you know, are very well uh, accepted in like, you know, keep doing this research because there are a lot of pieces in the puzzle that are missing and uh, especially related to the presence and the development and when Hatha Yoga was introduced from which groups and so on. But I really think that this connection between Hatha and Tapas has to be properly investigated. Do you, th- do you think Hatha Yoga is always tapas, though? Because if you look at, the, say, the Gita, I mean, it's very much framed that Hatha Yoga as being something which is comfortable, right? Like that you shouldn't do something which is pain, you know, which is causing your body pain or, or pushing your body, right? That that's actually a sacrilege. You know, when, it, when Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, if you punish the body, you're punishing me in the body, you know? I mean, yeah, have I mean, you found that kind of, have you found that river, that, that theme yeah, in, within the Sadhus as well? Yeah, do, yeah, there is also there. doing something. That, yeah, you know, yeah, because, that should, because I, should not be yeah, forceful. Yeah, the fact is that since we can say that there are two understanding of tapas, a form of tapas that we can see more meditative, more moral, that is also related to your behaviors, and mm. a form of tapas that is more physical and painful. So even in the sadhu society, we have these two different attitudes. Like if you put your body too much in that pain that is useless right because you are just causing pain to your body so there are some sadhus that are very critical against like for example the urdubahu that means those sadhus who keep the arms up because they say see what are they doing they are just ruining their body right so you can see both these kind of attitudes like people who mm-hmm. condemn this kind of tapasya that eventually are going to really um, hurt your body. Mm. And there are those who instead consider this like a, a form of old yoga, like prachin yoga. This is the ancient form of yoga. Yeah, but I mean, so, it's when you say hurt the body, that's an understatement. If you're, you, you know, you were talking about when you're standing with your arm up. Yeah, this then is really, really yeah. I mean, this, your, your arm is finished, you know, after, yeah, exactly. you know, after a short period of time, that, that thing does, is like a withered kind of branch that doesn't belong to the body anymore. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. I think, I think you said in another podcast, something like, I don't know, you go, I don't know whether the, the, after that time, like 20 years or something, whether they could ever get it back. And I was thinking, you know, that's an understatement. <laughs> They're never going to get that. You know, you could do yeah, whatever exactly. you wanted, but you know, yeah. you're never going to get that arm back. Yeah, you know? yeah. In fact, I mean, th- there is the the the, con- the the second part of that story actually, uh, because there was this very famous and very amazing Urdu Bahu again, the, the sadhu with the arm up, mm. Amar Bharti, and with a friend of mine, we were checking his, uh, you know, the photograph of him when he was young, and then. Uh, meeting him in the last Kumbh Mela, we could see that actually his arm was not that up as it was in the past. So eventually huh. it was like a, a bit straight in front of him. Right. So we were thinking huh. and wondering if he was doing some practices actually to bring it back. I mean, I don't know how, of course. But if you look at the photograph, like the earliest images of him and those like more recent, the arm was going down. I don't know if it is just because of the gravity. I'm not a physics, but um, you never know what he was doing. Maybe he had some kind of inner or some secret knowledge about this kind of procedure. Unfortunately, he died two years ago, so we will never know. Yeah. Do you think maybe he was he was finished with it and he was gradually bringing it back somehow with some kind of special sadhu kind of power? 
I don't know, but the fact if uh, it is interesting because there is the, the, um, this uh, report from Duncan in the 18th, 19th century, 19th century, uh, where he met this uh, Purnapuri. Uh, maybe even uh, Jim talked about uh, this Purnapuri. I don't remember. Is a is a famous ancient uh, like Urduba who was keeping both his arms up, and okay, he yeah. said to two employees of the British Raj that he. he his intention was to stop the tapasya after 12 years. So he declared that he was going to stop mm. being an Urduba mm. somehow. He yeah. doesn't explain how, but there is the intention of finishing the tapasya is there. So we don't know if he was able eventually to bring the, the arms down. I mean, for me, it's quite impossible because if you look at the arms of these people, oh, it, it, yeah, it's best, it's like just 100%. a mind. It's yeah. It's mind-boggling. I mean, when you speak to these guys, generally they're guys, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Is there any common theme? You know, the, the you know, kind of psychologically. You, don't you think? What is it that made these people do this? This extreme mortification of the body, which is life-changing. I mean, you could say it's a life-changing accident in a way. You know. Mm. Um, ah, there, there can be so many different reasons for doing that mm. because it's like some people some sadhus do tapasya even this very uh, painful one to have a vision of god to get connected with god other people consider that you know through the pain you get detached from the body so you are closer to your subtle body and since you are closer to the subtle body you are closer to god and mm. then there are uh, other people that do this kind that want to develop this kind of tapas, this inner heat, because in this way they can burn their karma. Because you know, when you burn your karma, then you are closer to moksha. Because mm. of course, I okay. mean, it, it's important the sadhana that you do, the discipline, the spiritual practice that you do. But if your karma, your residual karma is not burned, there's no possibility for moksha. So, you know, doing mm. tapas, you are also burning your karma. Mm. And then there mm. are sadhus who do this for the well-being of society. Because from like a cosmic era, we are in Kaling Yuga. And this is mm. the worst period ever. So the dharma is not supported and especially not by the lay people. So sadhus have to do tapasya to sustain at least the minimum, the dharma in the world. So it's kind of, you know, they do that for us. And I didn't realize that that was that intent as well in the sadhus. I thought it was yeah, a personal, yeah, you know, it was always personal liberation, but they're also no, going no, for there is also, of, Yeah, yeah, right. there can be also, the, it's, it's, in fact, there are some sadhus, sometimes they are asked by lay people to do some tapasya for solving some issues, like, for example, it's not raining in a village, please, right. uh, there can be a lay uh, devotee mm. asking a sadhu to do a form of penance. Or the sadhu can do uh, tapasya as a kind of vow to end something in the society. Like, you know, I want this to stop. I want uh, a statue of Anuman being built in my temple. And I will stay on my feet until this is realized. <laughs> and this is what they do. Because, of course, then there is the, let's say, the material side of the tapasya that attracts people, devotees. Yeah. Followers. Yeah, I was going to anyway. say, yeah. Do you, do, yeah. Did you find that um, yeah, of course. some of them are doing the tapas for the sake of fame or, uh, you know, or, or even are, are people doing yoga still for the sake of uh, cities, for the sake of magic powers? Oh, okay. You, These are two that? different uh, things. Uh, yeah, I they're mean, two they're two different are... things, but uh, yes, they're two different yeah. reasons why one might do something so extreme, yeah, right? exactly. which, are, no, which would be valid re potentially valid reasons yeah yeah exactly both indeed i mean sometimes you see that uh, there are sadhus that start doing tapasya before a mela just you know to get followers and uh, of course money because then uh, you see the sadhu doing something extraordinary and you give some donations and so there are this kind of um, I would not say fake babas but there are like some babas that are exploiting the situation or the tapasya but usually they do that very temporarily, like, you know, may, during the time of a festival. But just to do it, to, um, to impress others, no, because you need that kind of uh, intention. You, you have to have a, a stronger faith, especially for doing something like the Kareshwari, means standing, uh, standing up for mm -mm. 
ears or keeping the arms up like you know you ne- you really have to believe in something to, to 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 tolerate that kind of pain and then of course there are sadhus who do the different tapasyas because they believe in siddhis and especially uh, tapasyas that are linked to meditative practices are those that more likely are associated with Siddhis. So, for example, I met this uh, Jogi Baba, is a sadhu who lived in a forest in, um, I mean, close to Shantiniketa, West Bengal. And he meditated the three years in the hollow of a tamarind tree in the middle of the jungle, almost naked. I mean, this tamarind tree is fantastic. It's a huge, giant. You can really enter inside. I entered. I mean, yeah, it's but like... imagine all the insects and stuff in there. I mean, you must have gotten bitten to shit. Yeah, I mean, he said that he was fighting with the <laughs> environment yeah, yeah. But eventually. But, I mean, you know, this is the situation in which you don't know when there is the story and the history, no? Yeah, yeah Because it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. thanks to his meditation, he was able to create a very peaceful environment inside the whole mm. of, of the tamarind tree. And after three years, he got Siddhis. And Have you seen... Sorry, have you, have yeah. you seen... Carry no, no, say, say. Uh, uh... No, I was going to say, Jim, when I asked him, have you, when again, you know, Jim Manhassan has also spent much time, as, as Danielle has, with, uh, with you know, in, with Sadhus. Um, in fact, he's initiated, isn't he? Um, although he would, uh, you know, maybe claim differently or, you know, maybe mit- mitigate his initiation as he wants to. <laughs> but, um, you know, nevertheless, he, the best thing that he could tell me about his cities he'd seen was, um, his guru being claimed to have uh, be able to suck up um, milk mm. uh, with his penis and then and then pee milk again. I think that was uh, on the podcast and on our on our podcast when we uh, were talking about um, uh, these uh, these cities. So uh, I didn't think that was that impressive, really, as a city. Me too. You know, I mean, kind of a, good, <laughs> yeah. a, a pretty good part. You know, if you're going to do something, it's not a bad party trick, is it? But you know, it's yeah. not really what I would hope for as a city. Really, yeah. Have exactly. you seen anything better than that? Could you better that? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can I mean, see. I, I mean, at I one have point like... you talk. Sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. No, say, say. I was going to say at one point you really talk about, but you know, like the one thing I think someone asked you a question on another podcast. Have you, you know, how has your feelings towards this developed as you've gone on with the sadhus? And and you, you, I think you make something kind of gesture saying, "Well, I believe it." You know, I, I you know, I, I've seen enough that I believe what they're doing. You know, to be true, to be real, to be valid. You know. I mean, I think that there, there can be some cities, but, I mean, you know, the list of cities is, is very long and some are like, okay, impossible to believe. I've heard like David is talking about, you know, the sadhu becoming very small and uh, walking on the leaves of trees and whatever. But, uh, I mean, for example, not something that I have seen, of course, but something that I have felt, let's say, with some sadhus, very rarely, let's say, but that they could actually read the mind of people. Right. I don't know if that is impressive for you, but you know, when sometimes you are sitting well, it's and pretty good. <laughs> that you know, you are thinking in I'm I was thinking in Italian, you know, it's like whatever. And and you know the some and the sadhu is doing exactly what you were, you know, wondering or is ask or is replying to questions that you were like just um, okay, and that the next one will be this, or you know, these kind of situations. No, Even that's, among that's... many people, you know, you are a bunch of people, and you are doing some practices, and you feel whatever, and the answer that you get from the sadhu is like, oh, okay, thank you. This is what I was wondering. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if this can be uh, um, an example of cities, but. With some well, people, I think very it's a rarely. reasonable example. Yeah, if you've ever had it happen to you, and I—I I mean, my first yoga teacher was a—and you've been in England a bit, haven't you? Well, she was a woman. I was in in the East Midlands, right? I was in Birmingham, right? Like she was a Brummie uh, woman, you know, like um, older lady in the sixties, right? Um, and a yoga teacher, we could say asana, but something else. And um, I had a few lessons with her, like in private, you know, because there's something about her, you know, and and she had that power, you know. She does some some weird mind yeah. reading stuff, like, and when it happens to you, like, that's like, that's definitely like, wow, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it's something, something that, that someone that's... can develop. I mean, it's like if you work and do exercises on your brain that usually people don't, uh, something is going to happen. I mean, something can happen. I have no idea because, as Sadhu said, if you don't experience it, 
don't talk about that. So I don't have Cindy, mm. so I don't know if I can. I cannot speak about Cindy's. And of course, not in this life I'm going to obtain them. What was the most impressive thing that, uh, or, or sadly that impressed you the most in your time? Mm. Okay, this is a difficult question because, you know, I spent so much time among Sadi's mm. that basically nothing was... You must have met so many of them. Exactly. So yeah. basically nothing impressed me that much anymore like you know maybe at the beginning but i forgot about that that kind of experiences yeah but yeah. um what impressed me i don't know i mean i think the sadhus still still today the sadhus that impressed me more was this old baba from the ramanandi sampradaya very devotional sadhu who made me wait in his uh, temple like for three four hours actually was checking on me he was seeing, he wanted to test me. Like, he was like, okay, I'm coming soon. And then he left for hours and I was like, okay, I will wait here. And when he came back, I was yeah, still there. Yeah, yeah. So he was like, oh my God, yeah. you're still here. How dare you? But I mean, he was very kind eventually, very, and he was, you know, jumping and using um, very devotional uh, Hindu approach towards humanity, as well as mentioning uh, the gospel and Jesus, and at the same time, mm. even Karl Marx. So, huh. you know, this kind of very wide and opening mind, able to see this connection among, you know, different religions and different uh, thinkings and this and that. So this is a kind of, the kind of guru and the kind of sadhus that I'm really much impressed of like those mm. that go up beyond the yeah, labels yeah. of uh, Hindu, Muslim, and this kind of uh, you know just attributions. Because generally, you you mentioned on other uh, um, you know, other talks you've given that the sadhus really don't often know the text, you know, know the scriptures, exactly. right? It's, yeah, it's exactly. an oral transmission. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. Especially because I mean, of course. Well, they don't trust them. This kind of the sadhus I worked with, because of course there is all, there are all those sections that are very much, uh, you know, staying in monasteries and working on textual sources, and they are very much focused on the development of gyan. So you need textual sources. So like in the Dashnami Sampradaya, another Shaiva order, there is the Dandi section, and this is very much focused on textual sources. They are all Brahmins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But those I work with, they are more like uneducated people, let's say, and who are very much in this uh, parampara uh, way of learning. I learn from my guru because what my guru says is also what he has experienced. Because as I said before, you have to have the experience of what are you teaching to be mm. sure that you are teaching like in the way in the right way. Mm, right mm, and so it's it's yeah. that is also the reason why a sadhu can have different gurus because not one a guru cannot give you all the knowledge that you need for because it will be related yeah. to his own experience so if you yeah, have if yeah. you are interested in other issues stuff and teachings you can go and look for another sadhu another gurus but of course you have to have the permission from your guru mm. Did you see many Westerners as uh, sadhus? Are there many Westerners out there? There are in the of... Juna Akara. Right. Yeah, it's, it, because this Akara, this section, let's say, yeah. of the Dashnami Sampradaya is very open. Yeah. The Akaras, just to open a, you know, a little parenthesis, the Akaras is, yes. is this group connected to the Naga Sadhus, the, the, the warrior that historically was the, the, the most open group in the ascetic world and probably they, right. they they began in that way to introduce the low caste people in the sadhu society especially to make them um, you know fighting against other groups or working as mercenaries yeah. for temples yeah. or rajas and so on so because of these groups historically were very much like open from a social point of view in the 80s like the, of the 20th centuries, they also yeah. started slowing, slowing to open up to foreigners as well. Huh. So well, you see them there. Right, so you do them there, so you see them there. I mean, what is it, a, 
why when you see them like in, in the in the Kumbh Mela and stuff, and there's certain warrior sections, right? And they, they mm. kind of got their spears and they're you know, yes. it's like kind of militant. There's a militancy exactly. about it. The Naga Baba. What's that about? Why? Yeah, then why are they like that? What it because, doesn't seem very fitting with yoga. People would say, you know, there's a there's yeah, like because we have this idea of right? yoga, and we have this idea mm. of India, and we have this idea of ahimsa, non-violence, right? But mm, mm, it's it's yeah, really yeah. about how you use again. You have to um, frame people in the setting, right? If you are a warrior, yeah. and if you are a warrior to defend your religion or to defend your monastery. Or simply because your guru told you to do that, yeah, you 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 will use violence and you know fighting and this and that as part of your dharma. You will be non. It's like you know the Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. You can use violence as the sadhus were doing without being attached. Who? But who are they fighting with? Or I now, mean, the when past, they're militant, who are they fighting with now? Okay, in the Other past, groups of in, in, the, in the past, they were like uh, eventually they they really were mercenaries, so they were doing that for money. I have to say that because it's like you know they they became so powerful and they were acting like uh, you know kings uh, in specific uh, plots of uh, lands, and they were working for the English, working for the uh, Mughal and different princes. They didn't right. care about religion; they mm. cared about you know the the money that they were. Uh, getting yeah 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 yes so i mean that's why but it's historically it's not clear uh how it, it we, we see you know how, why this kind of ascetic groups uh, formed and developed and who were and if they started like fighting each other because there are also historical yeah. uh, Records Surely of did. you know Shaiva yeah, yeah, killings, yeah. thousands yeah. of Vaishnavas just for pilgrimage, you know, for getting the control of a pilgrimage site. So we have a lot of uh, this different kind of information. And do we also see a kind of nationalistic aspect of of Hatha yoga and, and towards the anti anti British anti colonial? So they, you know, is there is there that is there that strain there that the, the mean, Hatha yogis were kind of trying to build a, a strength of body and, and and this kind of thing to kind of kick out the British? I mean, we see the sannyas in rebellion that has been uh, you know very much uh, coloured over the the, the decades, right. but the mm-hmm. fact is that um, especially in West Bengal, um, mm. English the, the English Raj uh, forbidden sadhus uh, to wander. And so they were against this kind. I mean, they were using Naga Sadhus, okay. but at the same yeah. time, they didn't like the fact that there were this kind of, you know, people moving around in the empire and they were Sadhus. You cannot, you know, connect to a specific place or identify them, you know. So they were these people that have to be settled somehow. That is also why English, the, the English Raj was supporting a lot like devotional groups like the Ramanandi, the Vaishnava Sadhus, because they were more, they were closer to the idea of monks that we have in the Western countries compared to the naked, very aggressive, right. uh, you know, yes, Shaiva yeah. Sadhus. Yes, and and then unfortunately, as you were important, as you were mentioning today, the Akaras, the Naga Sadhus, of course, they don't fight each other. They have organized to be a kind of group. They, we have the family of the Akara, the Akara Parishad nowadays, that has the purpose of defending Hinduism, the Hindu Dharma. But unfortunately, yeah. you know, it's it's very easy to go towards the Hindu. Right wing, uh, mm, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is a very, yeah. very uh, sensitive topic. Yeah, but there's links. There's links there. You would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, there are organizations that are entering the Sadhu society, like very okay. nationalistic organization mm, mm, mm. entering yeah, the Sadhu yeah. society. That is going to affect the Sadhu. So- I mean, it's yeah. already affecting the Sadhu society, but uh, it's going to make it worse and worse. Interesting, and a whole other, a whole other kind of branch of mm. conversation. Um, going back to your experience of the sadhus, and and mm. you've been on record saying that you didn't 
you know, you've been offered initiations, you've been offered yeah. um, to be accepted in, you know, the kind of inner circle of teaching. You've decided, you know, you didn't want to do that because you wanted to write books um, that, that were uh, public books and the information that you would receive as an initiate would be private information you couldn't share. Mm -hmm. um, did you did you get the feeling that you were excluded? Did you get the feeling that there was teachings there that were kind of really, that, that were perhaps intriguing, interesting, deeper teachings that you weren't allowed to, to you, know, you weren't allowed to be part of, that you were kept separate from? when you were doing your field Yeah, well, of course, of course. I mean, first of all, we have to remember, I mean, I was a foreigner. And what I have seen from my experience, even uh, like, I mean, I can be uh, wrong, uh, of course, but this is, so this is just uh, what mm. I have, uh, and what I've been said yeah. from some mm. sadhus, a foreigner won't ever get the same teachings than an Indian. Because if you are born outside India, it's because of your karma. And so it means that you cannot get the same teachings as a person, but because your blood is different from an Indian. So you, you will not get... What you're saying get, is that you won't understand the teachings or they wouldn't give them to you because you're They were not given. So you will get something else. You will get another teaching or they will give you, yeah, some kind of uh, um, washed form of that teaching simply because you are a foreigner, because, you know, you, you weren't born in India. And this makes a big mm. difference. I mean, they believe in the karma. So if you were not born in India, there must be a reason. You can get initiated, right. but you cannot get the same result as an Indian. So, of course, I mean, right. I, I, and what I got it was uh, they were the information for even a non-initiated person. So very, I would say they, they are very on the superficial surface of, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It sounds a bit fascistic in a way that, you know, no one outside India will have the, you know, the true knowledge, right, that any other. I mean, how, what's their, what are their feelings towards other religions, you know, when, when, in the sadhus? Do they feel that the path of, you know, Jesus is a valid sadhu or, you know, or Muhammad, you know? Yeah, that, 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 that depends. That depends. First of all, depends, we have right. to point mm -hmm. to the fact that in India, people are not considered equal, even in their own society. Right. True enough. I mean, not mm. all the people yeah. can enter a sampradaya. If you are an untouchable, you are not going to enter a, mm. a traditional Orthodox mm. order. In some cases, mm. if you are a woman, you cannot enter it. Mm. So it's like it's not just mm. against foreigners; it's with yeah, their yeah, yeah. own people, right? And also, not all the people can receive the same teaching because your nature is different from that of another person. So a guru will teach different things according to the nature of his disciple. And this is very mm. uh, important and, uh, I said, clever, I would say. And, um, yes. And, and then I forgot about the second part of your question. Oh, I don't remember Boy, either. Um, mm. Come but, on, I mean, Adam. I think it, it, no, but it kind of, <laughs> well, it's interesting and it kind of makes sense. But, you know, but these days, obviously, we're, we're living in the, in, in the world in the West anyway, where there is, you know, this reticence to accept any kind of structure of hierarchy, yeah. elitism, expertise, right? Um, and, you, you know, that's very much part of the, the tradition of India, that, you know, there's a super hierarchy that, you know, some people are of um, uh, moderate or, or, you know, low disposition, so they will never get, you know, a higher teaching, exactly. right? Like, yeah, whereas yeah, exactly. these days, obviously, you know, in, in the West, it's like, well, everyone should be able to do all things, you know, they will, yeah. everyone has the equal ability, which is, you yeah. know, which is a nice idea, you know. Um, and, yeah, but, but then you know, it's like one day you're a shaman. Sometimes gets in the way of people. Yeah, and it gets in the way of people actually getting the teaching that they should have, like, you know, and it, you know, rather than someone saying, well, actually, you know, like, maybe you're not a cutout for high. I mean, you know, I was reading the Samkhya stuff last night, and I was like, you know what, like, this is just so tough, right? You know, like, you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, discrimination of the logical processes, right? It was like, maybe I'll just be more cut out for a bit of back tea, you know? Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right? that, but this is yeah. exactly the fact. I mean, you, you have to follow the, the path that is better for you because otherwise you're wasting your time. Exactly. Sadly, exactly. say, having a, um, um, the, the, the human body is a golden chance. Because mm. through the human body, you can get closer to moksha if you waste it, you know, because you want to be more fashionable or whatever. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just ego stuff. You have to really know your nature. That is also why it is important to meditate because, or to learn about yourself and to have a guru that helps you understanding your nature so you, you can find your, the best path for you.
You mentioned uh, uh, in a couple of minutes back about female sadhus. Did, have, yeah. you, were, have you seen many? Are there, are there many? Not that many, actually. I mean, the fact mm. is that uh, female asceticism is a very... Uh, it's a very complicated topic because right. it's not all the groups accept female ascetics. Okay. Those that do it keep them in a very low status. And sometimes right. you see a lot of female ascetics that are actually, you know, women without a male protections. So widows uh, right. or female yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. women that have any kind of problems uh, for for which they cannot marry. So these are those that are very well accepted. It's like instead of yeah. being in society yeah. lost by your own, please enter a devotional path, a religious path. And for those uh, women, uh, even the young women who want to enter uh, a, a traditional order, it's very complicated because first of all they have to find a guru. And they have to find a very like open mind guru who will take this risk of having a female disciple. Because society, what society is going to say about a very young female disciple in an ashram doing the practices with a guru? So I, I met, mm. I think I met only one female ascetic. I, I speak about her in my articles, Rampriya Das who decided to become a sadvi, that is the female of sadhu, when she was six years old, just looking at the, the one who was going to become her guru, meditating in a cave, and she had to fight against her family. And this is the history of female uh, ascetics in all the history of India, when you, you see this kind of you know scattered uh, uh, female ascetics like uh, Lalla or Mirabai, mm. they have always mm -hmm. to fight against what society was, you know, saying mm -hmm. about them. But nowadays things are changing because, the, you know, because of the feminist movement in India, there are a lot of uh, female guru not connected to orthodox uh, or traditional yeah, yeah. orders. So they are creating new movements and this is helping even other, like even some parts especially let's say educated and coming from middle class families women are slowly slowly conquering a space a position in the sadhu society and what about you i mean as a as a woman you want me to become a West, a, as, no 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 a not a sadhu but as a woman as a western woman like, as an ethnographer <laughs> i mean i would have expected that the sadhus would never have talk to you, you know, to get the information you have and to spend the time. I mean, what was the, can you speak about the general reaction they had towards you, you know? I mean, because it seems like they were kind of quite open to share with you, generally speaking, right? I mean, you mentioned one case where you asked a question and they just said, finish your prashad, you know, finish your sweet and get out of here, you know? Yeah. But I mean, which is, oh, it must have been an awful <laughs> moment, but you know, like, yeah, the you only know, one said, shit, I, you know, I was going so well, and they're just so like, close. Ah. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, generally speaking, they were kind of open, right? Like, they're open yeah. to, to speaking to you, yeah. Yeah, I think it's because uh, because of Hindi, first of all, you know, I could speak yeah, with them speak in Hindi, Hindi. Mm -hmm. and this was uh, very important to to break the highs. And and I was a, a foreigner woman, so it's like you know, as a foreigner woman, you are a bit less woman than an Indian. So because with Indian women, they have right. to follow mm -hmm. some kind of etiquette, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and also yeah. the You're women just would. Exactly. Yeah. But I was yeah. an outsider, so I could enter mm. places where it was written like outside women are not allowed. And I was like, but, but, but I am a woman. Oh, don't worry, you come here. So it's like, uh. I was less, I mean, I was more interesting as a foreigner than as a woman. So this was the, 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 the uh, a difference that allowed me to spend time with a lot of sadhus and entering spaces that in which women were not allowed, like Indian women were not allowed. Hmm. And then I spent a lot of time, you know, I was all, as, as you mentioned, I spent a lot of time in India. So it's like you meet sadhus one time and then you are again there, again there, again there. So you are part of the company, right? And, yeah, and uh, yeah. I'm very easy person. So people could talk with me easily. And I was but always what were you doing my exactly? Bike. Like, you know, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, when yeah. you talk about like, you know, like getting, because obviously 
you have some kind of vested interest in the back of your mind, right? Like, you know, you're hanging out, yes. you're hanging out, yeah. but you'd still kind of like got the detective, you know, like mind on, like, you know, yeah. just looking for it, right? Like, yeah, but, but I mean, just... you know, like, nevertheless, you can't just go in there, like all guns blazing. Okay, I want this answer, this answer, right? You have to just be there with them, hanging out. And I mean, what were you doing? I mean, because, you know, like these these things go on for days, right? And you're just yeah, sitting on the ground, like, I mean, you're smoking chillums with them? No, or, I mean, you know, no, like, no, no, way, you're not doing no, way. no, you would never no, do no. that kind of thing. No, no of course not. No, first of all, because a lot of foreign women do that. And so sadists have right. this idea that women smoke chillum and Indian women would not do that. And huh. I mean, hmm. Interesting. women from hmm. villages maybe could do that, but anyway, so this was a big difference. You know, because I was behaving in a very um, correct way. Like I was behaving as a, an Indian woman so to detach myself from, let's say, that kind of uh, hippie style of foreigners that go and sit with sadhus smoking chillum. I wanted to make mm. a distance. Like I always introduce myself as a scholar, as some a person studying. I don't want to be classified as a you know, just a random person. And then I was just right. sitting there. And, and then it depends because, I mean, you don't get information during the Mela when there are so many people around. So the festivals usually were for me the time to get connected with people. And then to be invited in case to go and to the ashram or temples to continue and to deep the, the conversation. Of right, course, in right, the right. Mela, so you the, can see the tapas yeah. and et cetera. And yeah, sometimes yeah, a... I went to the festival much before the big crowd arrived. So to to start the, the, the questions, but usually it took like months sometimes to just to have a kind of idea of the frame of the questions because I don't like stealing. I, I yeah, put yeah, the yeah. people in the position of talking to me if they wanted to. Otherwise, I was okay not getting anything. Like, you know, this is how it, it, I work. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you structure formal interviews or is it all kind of formal? Or do you get them and say, okay, like, you know, sit, you know, not mm. you sit down here. But, you know, nah, no. but you know, do you raise your time? Do you, I'm sure. But do you arrange your time when you, or, or is it all kind of, you know, ad hoc? Or is it a certain, okay, we're going to have a chat now and I've got some certain questions and, you know, how does it go? Or does it, or does it change depending I mean, that depends on the situations. Like in the Kumbh right, Mela, right. like in the festival, is more like you are, you are open to what people are also talking about. Because during the festival, uh, the, during the, the fire, there are also devotees coming, other sadhus coming. And the purpose of yeah. this festival is to talk about religious stuff and practices. So you have to have like uh, your senses all ready to, 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 to listen at what is going on and taking notes sometimes. Uh, but usually in these kind of circumstances, um, I try to memorize everything and then to note down things. In other so circumstances, sadi, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, no, no, I was going to say the sadhus are talking to each other, and you're yeah. listening because you can speak yes. Hindi and you're listening yeah, to what exactly. they're saying, and so yeah, that exactly. must be amazing. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think it's best natural if you know Hindi. <laughs> it's not. It's not amazing. <laughs> it's just normal, and and so. But of course, they are also saying a lot of gossiping. Eh? So, but it's interesting right. to know the Sadhu society actually, because yeah, then yeah, you yeah. realize the connection between the different sampradayas. That's interesting. But then, but like as I said, in some cases, I went to the ashrams or the temples or the places. And so they knew that I was coming to get like proper interviews. And so even in that situations, though, I gave the sadhus the, the maximum freedom. Like when you are ready, we can sit down and I will ask you questions. So in that case, I was like with the recording on and taking notes, going more deep in the, in the conversation. And, and but they, of course, they, they loved me. They allowed you. Yeah, of course. I mean, there there were sadhus that want they, they didn't want to be recorded. Yeah. So yeah, they yeah. were like, "You write down or you memorize whatever, but don't record <laughs> me." <laughs> uh, uh, you have to memorize it, right? You're like, just, mm, try to keep all the information <laughs> in mind. <laughs> Do they ask anything of you back in return? Of course, that's the the, the best part of doing field work. Like you know, it's a sharing. It's uh, so you give all the information. 
Mm, mm, mm. Uh, a lot is like, uh, how are you married? Why are you not married? First of all. And <laughs> then they were asking a lot about the Western culture because especially for uneducated people, we are all the same. Like there is this big, yeah. giant Western culture and basically right. it's based on Hollywood gossip. <laughs> so they were like, why people get divorced so often like in Western country? I'm like, it's not all the Western. I mean, Italy is not, uh, you know, Germany and it's not the US. Like we yeah, are yeah, a yeah. bit differentiated. Yes, so yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they asked, like, they were very curious about uh, Western world. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. What do we eat? Uh, and uh, what about the church? The role of family? All these kind of questions. I wouldn't necessarily have thought that. I mean, you know, going back to something before before we have to finish. I mean, going back to a more more serious heavyweight question. I mean, go. You know, on the ta- on the on the tapasic front, we've talked mm. a little bit about hatha yoga being used for tapas, and then you see you've got that frame that which is an ascetic frame of hatha yoga. Which, you know, really could, as you said, I mean, you know, could, I mean, it's kind of nothing to do with the kind of Hatha yoga that we know now generically in the West. I mean, holding your arm up really isn't, um, you know, the the common um, theme of a, a regular yoga class. You were like, come get on your mat and now we're going to hold our arm up for the whole duration of an hour. You know, like you don't, you know, right. So that doesn't really relate, right. You know, like. And then you've got the idea of Hatha Yoga as a steady seat, a kind of Patanjali and the idea mm. that, you know, Hatha Yoga is a stability. You've got two postures, Padmas and Siddhas, and, right, you know, like, uh, and then you've got the tantric idea, right, which is kind of latterly kind of creeps in in the, in the medieval period, I think, you know, we related to Buddhism. I think Jason Birch is doing a lot of work on how um, maybe they're not, not, not everyone is happy about this idea, but, you know, the Buddhist interpolates uh, Vedic thinking and, and, you know, tantra comes in towards Hatha Yoga. Did, did you see that i mean it's a long-winded way to say did, did you see that kind of vein of, of of practice within the sadhus as well that they were using it tantrically because you mentioned in another article mm. that once that they generally once they had suffered an accident or got ill or something you know and they were doing hatha they would ditch the hatha yoga for, for western medical um um you know uh, medicine or or you know their own cure you know okay I mean, can you refer? It's a big question. Go to the core. Oh, it's a, of it, well, it's a big uh, question. Adam. Sorry, the core. The core of it is a, is a simple one. Did you see okay. that hatha yoga being used for tantric purposes as well, for for energetically amending the body? Were they using asana um, okay. more subtly? Okay. On, okay. On the, you know, mm-hmm. along these lines. I mean, the fact is that there are different layers of meaning of hatha yoga in the sadhu society. Mm. As I wrote in my in the article you mentioned, let the sadhu talk. It's kind of stratification, layers of meanings that also involved this kind of more uh, physical or let's say more textual um, understanding of Hatha Yoga. So, of course, it is also there, the use of the body as a tool to create a balance of, uh, you know, the energies of the powers. Because even if they don't refer to textual sources, there is this idea of the, the body of the, the body conceived as the yogic body or the tantric body. So the idea of the, the, the chakras, the uh, ida, pingala, and all the values that have to be in balance. So of course is there. The fact is that this knowledge is just called yoga, or these practices are called yoga kriyas, right? So the pra- this is something that we have to stress because these um, labels probably were created by scholars like Pandit for mm-hmm. writing textual sources. And so mm-hmm. they are very important when you write, but when you practice, it doesn't matter how you call them, but the practices are definitely there. These, the, the Hatha Yoga practices are part of the uh, ascetic knowledge of the body and how to control the body because all these practices give you a, a very deep knowledge of the body, not just because the asanas are good for the external part, but then there are all the shatkarmas, there are all the pranayams and all the form of kriyas that probably we don't find in textual sources because they are transmitted orally that give you a different knowledge of the body, very subtle knowledge of the body to manipulate the subtle body, right? So they are definitely there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied, Adam, with this? (laughs) Well, it's a complicated question, isn't it? It is complicated. You mentioned that... I think in your article as well that, you know, they'll say, well, you know, 
uh, the sadhus this is well hatha you know hatha yoga means tapas and then they'll say but you know also the kriyas like you know exactly. you have to you know don't, don't forget don't forget the kriyas and don't exactly. forget that it's also related to pranayama Prana. you can't exactly. forget pran you can't forget breath is very close to what we're doing you know and but i mean when you see them practice you kind of think i mean and, and i usually i know that the practice is hidden you probably wouldn't have seen them practice much much of their mm -hmm. you know their their tapasya or whether it's physical or otherwise but when you see them practice it looks so different to the current yeah. you know uh, yoga class outside india you kind of you, you know you have to kind of wonder what kind of energy they're feeling and manipulating in, the, in that case right yeah it and, and it doesn't usually seem to be a, a kind of therapeutic use of oh we're going to do this for fitness you know we all no, no. you know, for mobilization of the body or you know to yeah. uh, you know for therapy yeah. you know yoga therapy being a more recent you know iteration yeah. of yoga right and yeah, I think it's, I would say it's more natural simply because it's very focused. Uh, uh, what I mean is like they do some practices because they need those practices. Like, okay, I have some back problem. I will do this, this and that. I have some stomach problem. I will do this, chat karma, this and that. Hmm. So they, they, they mm -hmm. have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. They are trained to get that knowledge and then they will use it on purpose. So that is, yeah. um, I think, is the, the it's like they get a tool and they will use it if it is necessary, right? Only if they need it, and of course. But then asanas they can do to to do some fitness every day, like fifteen minutes. But in their mind, is like this is just a temporary practice. It's not the sadhana. It's not part of the sadhana. Once you learn them, it's something else. And then, of course, yeah. the, the manipulation of the energy is you have them not in balance. And that's, yeah, obviously something very different to doing asanas for the sake of fitness. And I mean, I, I think you mentioned in another, another place that, that you asked a sadhu the, the same question. They said, well, I, I did the asanas because I was in a cave. And yeah, if I, exactly. was, I had space, I would go running. I would do running. But, you know, like, because meditation is very stressful for the body, you know, it yeah. makes the body very tight. And so that would just, you know, like... a Obviously, it's spatial. It's just logistics. Like you yeah, know, like, yeah, exactly. I don't know space. Like, yeah. it, it's very practical. Yeah. If you think, like, uh, even you know, in the Hatha Pradipika, it's described the place, the hut where you have to do the meditation, the, the practice. It's a very small place, so it's really how to manage the body in a limited, uh, yeah, in a limited area. Well, but of course, with a lot know. of okay. benefit. What's that? A lot of benefit? Uh, yeah, health benefit, of course. I thought you said in the article though that when they got sick, like, often when they got sick, they would just turn to Western medicine. Yeah, I think it's just because I think it's just as a quicker. You know, they want to go back to their practice, so it's like let's right, do it quicker right. as soon as possible. So just yeah, like, exactly. I'll take this or do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah we'll get back to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Um, we're, we've done an hour, Daniel. I don't want to keep you too long, but I mean, have you got anything else? In, you must have some kind of interesting anecdote to share of your time. Well, you know, like or some particular thing that sticks in your mind i mean um, the thing that you know i think you've shared before which i found funny was the the uh, penance of the sadhu that stands up all the time i'm not sure what it's called in hindi a standing Kare, up sadhu shwari. that can't you sit down yeah so it's that one and uh, and he wanted to go to the zoo with you so he said oh. well i want to go to the zoo and uh, but uh, we have to take a rickshaw and so he has to stand up so he's at, he's on the back of this rickshaw that you end up somehow driving to help out. Yeah, yeah, um, because the driver... This, and there's a picture of Danielle you can find online. It's very funny, yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. That the was the idea of the, the driver, He's got his uh, trident. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it, yeah. with the driver. And yeah, the, the driver. Sadhu seems to be in some kind of leopard skin, leopard skin <laughs> kind of attire yeah. as well. And he's standing on the back. You know, fantastic. Um, yeah, that's anything fantastic. Anything else that is... Uh, yeah, yeah. I Any don't know, other, Adam. This is um, a very difficult question because it's like... Yeah, because... I was in so many different situations and uh, I don't know I don't know I think that is a funny one and people can find a photograph it is of, a funny one I mean we always yeah. have to meet up sometime I'm just going to basically just make you tell me loads of stories really um, <laughs> yeah I mean you if just you have so many so many good yeah, stories I, but um, probably but what, some what about, would be um, weird I was going to say <laughs> yeah but that's fine I'm, I'm, I'm well into weird um, what, what about um Lastly, lastly, did you have you did you actually make friend? It sounds a funny question, but did you, did you actually make friendships with the sadhus? Is that with possible, some. or is there always a no, distance? No, it's possible. Or some of them friends. 
No, you with, some, with some with them or do some FaceTime with them. No, FaceTime, no, but uh, WhatsApp, <laughs> yeah, with, with yeah, two really? sadhus. Yeah, yeah, with yeah, two sadhus. Actually, one is from the Nat Sampradaya. It's very kind sadhus. I think this one can read the mind. And the other one instead is a Vaishnava sadhu who has uh, some, love. I mean, he has some problems, like heart problem, because he's in love with a lady, and of course he's a sadhu. So he's asking me for advice about what to do. I'm like, go to your guru. I cannot tell you what to do. But so, but, but because I mean, this is something interesting. You know, the the smartphone really changed the life of sadhus, and they can get in touch with uh, women, especially foreign ladies, and uh, and then they are distracted. And they distract themselves with all the social media and uh, they are troubled. So th this person, th this sadhu... They've all got the smartphones. Is... How do they afford them? Sometimes they have just, uh, you know, devotees that donate uh, sadhus this kind of uh, high-tech stuff because they think that sadhus need a mobile phone. So it's like they give, them, they, they, they give to them like an iPad, a laptop or whatever because they think they need that. But then they are trapped in this kind of um, modernity and social media. Social medias are very, uh, I mean, especially young sadhus are very much addicted to social media. Mm. Oh, gosh, what a shame. I never would have thought that. Right. So, yeah. they've, all, so they've all got, they've all got, have they all got the iPhones or how, how prevalent is that? I mean, it's this, uh, you know, whatever that can be a smartphone. So. Yes, I'm not talking. They don't necessarily have the Apple brand, but yeah. you know, they've all they've got. They've generally got. They've just generally, yeah. the, you know, the sadhus now are you know kind of online with access and using. Yeah, they connected are connected with social media with oh, the world, oh. and I mean they are connected with the yeah. world because nowadays they can go on YouTube and you know get influenced mm. also by, by us, let's say by new age uh, theories or modern yoga stuff. Uh, they are getting dead. That is also why the Hatha Yoga project was very much on time because I've seen in the last years big, huge changes in the way sadhus relate right. to modern yoga. Right. And to, to what end? It's like, you know, getting and uh, more interested in asanas, in showing asanas, in teaching asanas. So really the focus, uh, even in the sadhu society, from a superficial, let's say, external point of view, is mm. move, has moved towards asana instead and meditation. Okay. okay. So this is, I think it's a big change. Right. Well, we've done now. I could talk to you for ages, but I'm conscious of your time. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, well, that was great, Daniela. Um, thanks Thank so much you, for Adam. coming on. And uh, I really don't know how created... better to end it, but, um, you know, um, please, uh, if, if anyone's watching, if anyone bothers to watch this stuff, please like it, subscribe it, and uh, and. Do whatever you have in the chat box in terms of comments and uh, I'm sure either I or hopefully I'll ask Daniela if you've got of any course, questions yeah. about this because it's a super interesting topic and um, yeah and we thank Daniela so much for the time and coming on and, and uh, expanding what is a unique position in, in, in her work and you know that she's she's had this opportunity so so thanks that's all I can say thank you. Uh, thank you Adam because you created a very friendly and uh, lovely environment even if at distance. Oh, that's very kind of you. Very kind of you. Oh, all right. Well, we all enjoyed ourselves. Right. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's what we want. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao then.